I'll just introduce to you Dr. Naomi Tulin, um, who is an academic fellow with the Center for Critical Qualitative Health Research and an investigator with the MAP Center for Urban Health Solutions at St. Michael's Hospital, uh, and also assistant professor in the Dalana School of Public Health. Uh, Naomi is very familiar with Jana's work, and so we are delighted, Naomi, that you were able to join us today to introduce our speaker uh, to the folks who are here. So I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Blake, and hi, everyone. Um, as Blake mentioned, I am a CQ fellow, and I had the pleasure of reading Jana's dissertation um, because I'm on the awards committee and she submitted it for a methodological award. And uh, I'll start with maybe a more formal introduction. I'll read you her bio, but then I want to just share a couple of personal reflections um, on my experience of engaging with her work. So Dr. Jana McLaughlin is an occupational therapist and graduate of the a social and Behavioral Sciences doctoral program at the Dalalana School of Public Health at the University of Toronto. She is a white woman of European ancestry who is living in Nunavut. Dr. M Dr. McLaughlin's research employs Indigenous and critical social science approaches to address issues of equity, power, and privilege in health, especially focusing on work that supports Inuit knowledge to be foregrounded in health and social services offered to Inuit. In her doctoral research, this included critically reflecting on the relationship between Inuit and Western systems of knowledge as they apply to rehabilitation services offered to Inuit children. Dr. McLaughlin is currently a Banting postdoctoral researcher at Key EGRT, hopefully I said that right, Jana, um, Health Research Center in Iqaluit, Nunavut. Um, so I just wanted to share, as I mentioned, a couple of personal reflections. When I was first assigned a Janet's, Janet, a Janet's dissertation, I could tell by the title, of course, it was going to be involving engaging with the Inuit community. And at first I thought, oh, well, maybe Jana is Inuit. And very quickly I saw that she wasn't. And I thought, well, this, this is going to be interesting to see how she engages in this work as an outsider, because I think many of us can understand that it can be problematic um, engaging in this type of work as an outsider. Um, there were three things that really hit me when I was when I was reading her dissertation. The first one was, I guess, a set of core values that seemed to guide Jenna's work. I felt like I kind of knew her a little bit by the time I finished reading. That was humility, a vulnerability, and authenticity, which came through through right from the very first sentence in her dissertation. And it wasn't just a standalone thing, it was woven throughout. She took that up again and again, right to the very end. The second thing, she has this title, um, this section of her dissertation that says, coherence does not require a unified epistemology. And so she foregrounded, and she'll explain all this, of course, but Inuit worldviews and critical social theory was like a support, played a supporting role. And she developed this, beautiful like four page uh, chart about how um, those two Two views were different and how they were the same, but didn't just leave it at that, created like how can we bridge between these worldviews um, and developed an accountability framework, which she then published. Um, and then the final thing, which I thought was so cool, was that you could really see how the Inuit community was really guiding her work. Uh, her analysis was participatory, and a lot of people say that, right? But like, what does that mean? And she gave this really great example of how she had written part of her findings and she took this back um, to the participants and that just didn't resonate uh, with them. So she removed it from her dissertation. Um, and I, 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 I thought that was really cool. Um, so I'm really excited to hear you speak some more, Jana. And honestly, it's probably one of the best dissertations I've ever read. So I'm super excited for your talk today. So I'll hand it over to you. Oh, wow. <laughs> thank you so much for that very generous introduction. Um, thank you, everybody, for welcoming me here today. Um, it's really an honor to be able to present to you all on um, the methodology work, um, which was difficult work, I'll say that from the start, um, but really um, productive. And I think, um, yeah, I was really happy with where it, where it got in the end. Um, so this work is about uh, navigating tensions in uh, bridging the critical research paradigm with Inuit worldviews 
Um, and as my title suggests, I really ground this learning in the context of it being in Inuit Nunangat or the lands that Inuit have had a relationship with for millennia. Um, and so really place was an essential part of this learning. Um, you know, Inuit worldviews are relational, they're experienced relationally. It isn't just something that I could have read in a book. You know, it, being here uh, in Nunavut was really essential uh, to the process. So as we go forward, I'm going to obviously be changing slides, but the bandwidth in Nunavut is, um, I recently read uh, eight times worse than the average bandwidth elsewhere in Canada. So I apologize if there's a bit of a delay um, as I'm changing slides. Um, we'll do our best. <laughs> um, so I wanted to start with acknowledgements up front um, because my presentation is really about work that was only made possible by these folks, um, by Nunavut, by residents of Nunavut, including participants and community members who agreed to advise me along the way, um, especially uh, uh, Letia Janes, who became a co-author on several manuscripts, my supervisor and committee members, uh, Northern researchers like Gwen Healy Akiarok and Janet Tamluk McGrath, who did a ton of foundational work to elevate Inuit ways of knowing. Um, and of course, funders uh, who made sure that I had food on the table and who supported my work. Um, and so if at the end of this, you find yourself wanting to know more about what I share today, you can find it published in the International Journal of Qualitative Methods. Um, and so Hopefully the slide comes through showing that. Um, and so I'm gonna move on to um, sort of position the discussion uh, today. Um, what I'm gonna share really needs to start with some background. Uh, and, and the whole presentation is really sort of in the form of a story uh, because navigating the tensions was really a learning journey for me. Um, so, the first picture that I have here on the slide um, is a picture of myself with my partner, Nick, and our daughter, Josephine, who is 17 months old today. Um, I'm a white woman of European descent, and I grew up in a rural community in Mi'kmaq, in a place known as Shelburne, Nova Scotia. Uh, prior to moving to Nunavut, I knew almost nothing about this place or the people who live here. In my 20s, I became an occupational therapist, and with basically just a sense of adventure, uh, I wanted to move somewhere that I'd never been before. Um, and so uh, on the screen now is a picture of me on the day I moved to Nunavut and, and a map to show kind of where I was moving to. Um, and so I moved to Nunavut for the first time in 2006. I took my first OT job here, and I've been sort of in and out of Nunavut uh, ever since, uh, living and working here at different times. Um, and I also have a picture on the slide um, that'll hopefully show for you soon of Umingmak School, which is one of the schools that I worked at as an OT over the course of my time here. Um, so despite Nunavut being a territory of Inuit homelands within Canada's borders, healthcare continues to primarily be delivered by non-Inuit providers uh, following a service delivery model designed in Southern Canada. From the beginning of my time working in Nunavut, I really, I, I got this sense even early on that the occupational therapy that I had been trained to provide didn't always meet Inuit families' needs. And so when I began my doctoral degree, I really wanted to interrogate the status quo and to gain new knowledge so that I could see ways to do better. And so as I entered the earliest stages of my doctoral research, this is about all that I knew. I knew that I wanted to interrogate the status quo and learn ways to do better from the perspectives of Inuit. So when seeking to question and disrupt the status quo, the critical research paradigm is an obvious way to go, of course. Um, but at the same time, in order to hear Inuit perspectives and produce findings that would be most relevant and useful uh, in Nunavut, I really needed to ground my work in Inuit ways of knowing and doing, um, sometimes referred to as Inuit Kayumayatukangit or Inuit worldviews. So my experience as a non-Inuk clinician working in Inuit communities was um, seeing that Inuit worldviews were all around us and really had a lot of knowledge to offer. But this knowledge was and still is largely viewed as a quote unquote nice to know or an add-on to 
you know, quote unquote, the real evidence-based practice that we were trained to do in Southern Canada. It felt as though I really needed to be hit over the head to recognize that the evidence I should be drawing on was the evidence from this place and that it should be considered a foundation of my practice and not just a nice to know. And so here I was, I began uh, to imagine how both the critical and Inuit perspectives might work together in research. Um, and here's where I wish I knew how to make a GIF, you know, kind of the memes that move, <laughs> because I have this idea for a GIF that I'll just have to describe for you because I don't know how to make them. <laughs> um, but this is what I was thinking was, I basically imagined a football field where critical worldviews tackled the status quo to make way for the quarterback Inuit worldviews to run through for the touchdown. So I was imagining this as both important team members that enabled the goal, the shared goal to be reached. But what does it mean to attempt to bring critical and Inuit worldview perspectives together in practice? Um, so to start thinking about this, I had to go to the level of paradigm. Um, so research paradigms are a set of beliefs that guide actions. And each paradigm comes with its own tradition of research and specific philosophical, theoretical, methodological beliefs that guide how research happens. And so typically, when we think of research paradigms in qualitative research, uh, the ones that I hope you're seeing on the slide now are, are kind of the most common ones that come up. I have uh, critical, positivist, and interpretivist um, paradigms in blue boxes. And those ones, as I understand them, have largely emerged from Western ways of knowing. Increasingly, we're learning more and more about Indigenous research paradigms, um, and it is important to remember that there's no pan-Indigenous paradigm. Um, there hasn't really been formal discussion in the literature about an Inuit research paradigm per se, but there's certainly lots of discussion about how Inuit ways of knowing and doing inform research uh, from the perspective of a distinctly Inuit worldview. And so I wasn't just proposing to bridge paradigms, but also worldviews, right? A Western worldview and an Inuit worldview. Um, my mother would say that I never do things the easy way. And so this is just consistent <laughs> with that. Um, and now also an important side note before I continue, Inuit worldviews can themselves be understood as inherently critical uh, because problem solving, planning for the future and evolving knowledge based on current evidence is a key part of Inuit ways of knowing. Um, but as a Western trained non Inuk academic, I was entering the research space with a Western informed understanding of critical perspectives in the context of research. So, you know, in order to collaborate then with Inuit worldviews, there, there was essential bridging work that, that had to be done. And there is lots of support and precedent out there for bridging Indigenous and Western paradigms in research. Um, the respected late elder Alpilarjuk taught that Inuit and Western systems must work together and they're stronger together. Um, he advocated for finding ways to bridge the two worlds together. Um, there's a scholar, Nakata, that I have read some of their work, um, and in their description of the cultural interface, discuss how Indigenous uh, and Western knowledge systems already exist together in sort of a complex and contested space. Um, and so, you know, these knowledge systems, they're in the same spaces already together. They're constantly evolving and informing one another. Uh, they're not the same, but they're also not entirely separate. Um, and so finding a means of bridging them in a space in a way that supports Indigenous interests can be really beneficial for Indigenous people. On top of that, um, because research in Indigenous communities in Canada is taking place in colonial spaces, it can be helpful to engage a critical anti-colonial stance in partnership with an Indigenous approach. Um, and so, you know, folks have written about how doing that can help counter colonialism in a way that centers Indigenous ways of knowing. It can promote social change and support the self-determination of Indigenous peoples. Um, and there's certainly precedent for others who have done this in their own research work. 
So let's do it. Um, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> um, and so I, on the slide now, there's a picture of a bridge that's coming together, but not quite matching. Uh, so this is to show that saying there's support for paradigm bridging is not to suggest that it's an easy exercise. And so I see there being two primary challenges to bridging paradigms. First of all, tensions are going to exist between paradigms. Um, if each paradigm has their own ontology, epistemology, axiology, and praxis, um, they're, they're each going to focus researcher attention uh, in specific ways. You know, they're going to guide which questions are worth being asked, how those questions are framed, how the work is theorized, what methods are used, and, you know, how do we engage with data and analysis, and even what knowledge comes out at the end. So, of course, different paradigms each have their own logic and norms and are going to point the researcher in very different directions over the course of a project. So that's one challenge. Um, the second challenge is power dynamics. Um, and power dynamics, the reality is they're just largely going to privilege Western perspectives over Indigenous perspectives. But, you know, if you're going to bridge you really need to bridge equitably to ensure that the indigenous paradigm or worldview doesn't get subsumed or tokenized within Western paradigms. And this is not easy when Western norms are baked into mainstream academic training for a large part. Um, they're in academic literature and all the structures of research governance, funding and ethical approvals in our country. Systems and societal conditions in Canada are generally not set up to privilege Indigenous paradigms in research. And so without carefully attending to the character of the perspectives that we're saying we're going to bring together, researchers may inadvertently prioritize what they know best, which is often going to be the Western uh, knowledge base. Um, so in projects that claim that they're bridging paradigms, um, what has happened, unfortunately, many times is that the Indigenous paradigm has been sidelined or tokenized or involved as an afterthought. Um, and that's really dangerous because, you know, when a researcher writes that they privileged an Indigenous paradigm, but didn't actually do that in practice, they may persuade readers um, that it was privileged. Um, and that can lead to further obscuring of the Indigenous perspective and reifying the Western hegemony in research. Not to mention that superficial inclusion of an Indigenous paradigm is going to likely produce incoherent research outputs because the logic has been probably inconsistently applied or, or just kind of, you know, put on as icing. On top of all that, um, as if we needed more power dynamic problems, um, researchers working in Indigenous communities often hold various forms of privilege associated with power and influence, you know, whether that's whiteness or formal education, access to resources, but all of these things can really obscure Indigenous voices too. Um, and so to illustrate this point in the context where I was proposing to do my doctoral research, this quote from Karatak and Tester, I think, makes it clear. Um, and so a quick definition before I read the quote, um, the word kalunat is the Inuktitut word used to describe non-Inuit, and it often refers particularly to white people. Uh, so the quote is, Inuit and Kalunat now live together under Kalunat authority using Kalunat systems, which affirm Kalunat values. Importantly, though, there is movement and momentum to change this, uh, and researchers need to get on board. Uh, I've now got a screen with um, some quotes from the National Inuit Strategy on Research, published by the National Inuit Organization uh, called Inuit Taparit Kanatami. And this report really calls for Inuit self-determination and governance in research. Um, and so the first quote is, for far too long, researchers have enjoyed great privilege as they have passed through our communities and homeland using public or academic funding to answer their own questions about our environment, wildlife, and people. Many of these same researchers then ignore Inuit in creating the outcomes of their work for the advancement of their careers, their research institutions, or their governments. This type of exploitative relationship must end. And secondly, Colonial approaches to research in which the role of Inuit is imagined as being marginal and of little value, value remain commonplace. 
And if I could just put all of this into the context of current events too, um, just yesterday, Justin Trudeau was in town to sign a devolution deal with the territory. So this agreement transfers responsibility for land and water management, including resource development from the federal government to the territorial Nunavut government. And it's really significant because it supports Inuit self-determination by ensuring that decisions about Inuit lands are actually being made on Inuit lands. And so this is really another signal to researchers uh, to act in ways that uphold Inuit self-determination rights and that value Inuit worldviews. The way that things have always been is just not good enough anymore. Um, <clears throat> so now I'm at the point in my journey where I've decided to bridge critical and unique perspectives in my research, and I'm ready to think about what this actually means. What do I actually need to do? Um, and so I made a list because I'm a list person. <laughs> um, and maybe I'll just check in quickly. Tenzin, how quickly are slides matching what I'm saying now? Is it, it getting looks, any better? It looks great. It's coming really quickly now. Okay, great. Okay, because the next <laughs> the next bit isn't going to make as much sense if it's too delayed. So here's my list of uh, what I needed to do. I needed to produce something beneficial for Inuit and healthcare providers in Nunavut. I needed to complete a quality dissertation and meet U of T expectations, foreground Inuit worldviews, resist Western hegemony, uphold Inuit rights, especially self determination represent myself appropriately as a white woman from Nova Scotia, not be another white extractive researcher. I needed to coherently bridge Inuit worldviews and critical theory in a way that addresses research objectives and that's relevant to Inuit. I needed to demonstrate accountability to Nunavut or the people of Nunavut, colleagues and stakeholders. I needed to design a methodology that enables all this. And I needed to make sure it all made sense. <laughs> so if this slide is confusing and overwhelming, I did that intentionally because I wanted to give a sense of how I felt going into this. Um, and here's also where I'm reminded of my 17 month old daughter who, you know, sometimes will explain something to her and she'll say, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, as if she understands when in reality, she has no idea what to do. Um, and that's how I felt. You know, I knew what I needed to do because I've got a list. I know what I need to do. It's all here. Uh, but I had no idea actually what I had to do um, in concrete terms, right? Uh, and so, you know, luckily existing literature had great advice to get me started talking about practicing reflexivity, building authentic relationships, um, collaborating with indigenous communities, confronting colonialism and redressing power differentials, you know, listening in humility and building a space where paradigms can work together. So this was all great, but it didn't feel like enough concrete direction to guide what my actions would be on the ground. So it was at this point that my committee member, Anita Benoit, advised that I look for Inuit knowledge on bridging worldviews. Um, many of you have probably heard of two-eyed seeing, and so I was thinking about that, but that is uh, an approach that's grounded in Mi'kmaq ways of knowing. And I was working with Inuit thousands of kilometers away. The respected uh, Enoch elder, who I'll mention uh, a few more times, Alpilarjuk, um, was recorded by McGrath describing how differences in land contribute to differences in thought. And so I really felt that I needed to find local ways of knowing about how to bridge worldviews. And after some digging, I found uh, the Inuit value of Pilari Katiginik and also the Kagek model. Um, neither of these is specifically about bridging paradigms or ways of thinking. But through their character really gave me some substantial guidance. So first of all, Pilari Katiginik is an Inuit value that describes working together for a common cause. Uh, and this value is highlighted in the Pilari Katiginik Partnership Model of Community Health Research on this screen, uh, which was developed by Gwen Healy Akiarok and Andrew Taga. And I believe that was actually part of her own dissertation research when she was a doctoral student at Dalalana. Um, and this model, which became the basis of my research methodology, is grounded in Pilari Katiginik. It emphasizes relational accountability and collaboration among anyone who has an interest in contributing to the common good. So through this model and the value, um, bringing multiple perspectives together is considered to strengthen the work, helping it to be more broadly relevant. 
So Pilari Katigini guided me to reflect on how Inuit worldviews and the critical paradigm might work together following this vein. And secondly, the Kagik model, uh, which came out of Janet Tamalik McGrath's doctoral work. Uh, seems like there's been a lot of really productive doctoral work happening in Inuit. Um, but the Kagik model emerged from in-depth discussions between the elder Alpilarjuk and Tamalik McGrath. It employs the metaphor of a Kagik, or a large communal igloo, which is what you see being built in this picture from Iqaluit a couple of years ago. So she uses the Kagik to describe the space in which Inuktut knowledge renewal can occur on terms consistent with Inuit values. In this gathering space, relationships are renewed, skills are built, and problems are dealt with, because group harmony is essential to everybody's well-being. In her book about this work, she documents how Alpilarjuk uh, encourages Inuit and Western knowledge systems to work together. He stresses, however, that Inuit knowledge must be privileged on Inuit lands. In support of this, McGrath describes the Kagik model as a conceptual space where non-Inuit can, quote, listen, experience, and observe the strength of Inuktu renewal so that they can understand more clearly what they need to support. So I found that really helpful for thinking about how I could engage as a non-Inuk in respectful and accountable relationships with Inuit and Inuit knowledge on Inuit lands. So both, here we have two uh, uh, concepts coming from Inuit knowledge that would both provide me with guidance on how relationships and power sharing could be structured according to Inuit epistemology. Both concepts um, supported me to foreground Inuit ways of knowing from my position as a Kalunat and provided consistent refer reference points for decision making all the way through the project. And then I had to wonder, okay, what, what can I draw from qualitative health research literature to guide me as well? And so here's where I would like to thank Denise Gestaldo for really setting me off on the path uh, towards where, what I'm presenting here today. Um, because in one of her classes, I was talking about, you know, what I hope to bring together in the research. And she encouraged me to figure out how to make sure that everything was logical and made sense when these two very different epistemologies were brought together. Uh, and so this is where I went down the rabbit hole and I'm going to take you with me <laughs> here for a little, a little tour. Um, so I started with the idea of epistemological congruence. And I wrote about this for a while. Um, but through this lens, I felt like I was trying to, to look for alignment of epistemology, which wasn't actually maybe what I wanted to do, um, because the two perspectives weren't always going to align, and, and I didn't feel like forcing was going to uphold my project objectives. Um, so then... I found the idea of methodological coherence, and it seemed like more people working in my field of study were using this terminology. Um, and I, I liked the idea of coherence over congruence. Um, I don't know, congruence felt like it was more about fitting well together and being similar, whereas um, definitions of coherence felt more like uh, ideas of being logical and consistent. And so that felt more comfortable. So I started to write about this idea. <laughs> um, you know, it's talked in the literature about um, existing when all aspects of a project from research question to the theories, to the methods and conclusions align in terms of the assumptions made and the logic or rational employed. Um, and that might have worked, but I, I wasn't sure that I could always find alignment. Um, and it didn't, I don't know, it didn't quite feel right. So then I came to meaningful coherence. Um, so meaningful coherence is a marker of research quality that reflects the alignment or fit between parts of a study. Uh, a study has meaningful coherence when it achieves its intended purpose, accomplishes what it purports to be about, employs methods and means of knowledge representation that align with its theoretical foundations, and interconnects all, uh, all aspects of the project with one another. Um, the initial hook for me was how Tracy writes about the concept of being flexible enough to apply across paradigms in qualitative research. She describes that when there are apparent disjunctures between aspects of a study, researchers can be transparent and explain why their choices make sense in the context of research. 
With this kind of flexibility, differences in thought and approach can actually be valued and celebrated. Um, and so this felt like a concept that would work for me. Um, and I even found some precedent from Indigenous scholars referencing meaningful coherence in work that described Indigenous and Western paradigm bridging. So I'll admit I didn't put this whole rabbit hole in my dissertation, but I thought if anyone might appreciate this particular journey, it might be the CQ crowd. <laughs> so I hope it wasn't too dry. Um, so now I had three guiding concepts to help me bridge paradigms. Pilori Kataginik and the Kagik model would guide how I bridge Inuit worldviews and the critical paradigm in the actions that I took in the research, while meaningful coherence would remind me to apply this bridging consistently across all stages of the project. So it was really a big uh, process support. Together, these three concepts provided me with a consistent system of logic to follow throughout. So then how do I actually apply these concepts in practice in the research? How do I make sure that they guide my research actions and decisions so I achieve all those things that I listed on that big slide um, that I needed to do? <clears throat> so kind of like a giant worksheet, this table started to evolve, um, the seed of which was actually part of my final term paper for Denise's class. So thank you for, for that opportunity. Um, and so this worksheet table became a place where I could work through methodological issues guided by those three concepts. And so this became a living and evolving table as I finished up my research, and it was really productive. Um, and so I published it. I don't think the journal layout folks were super happy about the size of it, but we made it work. <laughs> it's, it's actually become the butt of a joke in our house about how big this table is, but anyway. <laughs> um, so here is the framework in a much more digestible format, and I'll break it down further. But at the center of this framework is the objective to bridge Inuit worldviews and the critical research paradigm. So there are three rings around this central purpose. The outermost ring describes the actions I'm going to take at a particular stage. The middle ring is the content of focus. And then the center ring is my overarching uh, reflective question um, that I'm addressing at that stage or, or what I'm looking for, or listening for at that stage. So in this first of the three sections, uh, I'm focused on learning about Inuit worldviews and the critical paradigm. I'm looking to draw out points of alignment and tension, and this is largely preparatory work. And that learning informs the medium shaded section um, in which I plan how the project should move forward, guided by lessons from Pilari Katiginik and the Kagik model. So at this stage, I'm focused on the relationship between Inuit worldviews and the critical research paradigm, examining what this means in terms of what I actually do. So this is a more analytic stage where I'm making methodological decisions and then I put them into action. And from here, I move to the darkly shaded section where I evaluate the plan's execution. I examine the plans and actions that I've put into, put into action um, and I consider how it's going. I note both ongoing tensions, but also productive opportunities that were made possible through the bridging. And when I encounter these new possibilities and tensions, I can then circle back to the light green section again to renew learning, to revisit project intentions and objectives, and then re-examine where to go next. So looking again at the framework as a whole, this is really a cyclical process that can be th repeated throughout the research timeline. And I really have to credit my committee member, Andrea Anderson, for helping me to see it in circular terms. Uh, once I drafted the three-part wheel, she also observed that it was kind of shaped like a vertebral bone. And so that's when we added these ver vertebral processes to, to the image. Um, and that was perfect as a metaphor for how this framework could be like the backbone of the study around which everything else could be built and articulated. So the framework supports meaningful coherence by helping me to intentionally reflect on how the decisions and actions I was taking actually fit with my intentions and the objectives of the overall research project. And now back to this big old table, <laughs> which I admit is a lot, um, but I'm going to break down how it was really useful for methodological problem solving and planning. Um, when that framework you just saw is applied to this table, it becomes a bit of a worksheet where I could plug in questions that I needed guidance on um, for both the critical and research, sorry, for both the critical research paradigm and Inuit worldviews, I asked a series of questions. So those questions included, uh, what do the paradigms hold as common objectives? 
whose voices are centered? Where should power or control be located? What's the connection between context and knowledge? How does one engage with their own knowledge? How are relationships considered? Are we focusing on strengths or deficits? How does learning happen? How is knowledge shared? How are findings acted on? And all of these things are viewed differently through the two perspectives. And so for each question, I could go through the stages of reflecting on what have I learned? What should I do? And then how's it going? Um, and see how it's all coming together. So uh, I won't make you read the whole table, I promise. Um, but I'll do just a little walkthrough of one example here. So for the question of what are some common objectives in the light green section, I recorded that Inuit worldviews often speak of working for the common good, a good life, balance and harmony, uh, and self-determination. The critical research paradigm speaks often of social justice, emancipation, equity, uh, illuminating and shifting power uh, relations. In the medium green section, I evaluated the alignment between these two perspectives on this topic. Um, and I sort of came up with uh, the that they had different points of departure, but with good potential to work together because really the common good, harmony, and a good life, those kind of describe what a socially just society might look like. Uh, so from here, I decided that bridging actions aligned with Pillary Katiginik and the Kagik model might include framing research objectives in terms of social change with an imperative to restore balance and harmony. I could include critiques of how colonialism disrupts the balance and negatively impacts the common good uh, and uphold Inuit self-determination through the design and outcomes of the project. So then in reflecting on what was made possible by bridging ideas about uh, the objectives you know, of the two different perspectives, I noted that um, as one example, with better understanding of different perspectives, is better understanding of how we can respect and learn from one another. So for example, I came in with what I thought the common good meant, um, but that really evolved and it's shifted now much uh, towards more of perhaps what Inuit would describe as a definition for the common good. And I'm really hopeful that that will support the relevance of my findings. Um, and then in terms of unresolved tensions that remain, um, I noted that the Inuit worldview objectives feel welcoming, but the critical paradigm objectives kind of, they intend to unsettle, you know, it's, it's more of a, a different tone. And I felt that it was difficult to represent both tones at the same time in my writing. So this is a demonstration of uh, how the framework supported me to consciously employ the guiding concepts and to focus my attention on intentionally, transparently, and concretely mapping out how the paradigm bridging would occur. So this mapping process, it, it helped me to stay accountable to my commitment to foreground Inuit worldviews and to, to work towards equitably bridging the two perspectives. And of course, there's a lot of learning that came from this. Um, and I have uh, three key lessons. So the first, um, as was mentioned at the very beginning, um, coherence does not require a unified epistemology. Um, that was something that I came to through this. When I started and I was thinking that I needed epistemological congruence, I was really focused on uh, documenting all the ways that the critical paradigm and Inuit worldviews were similar. Um, but when I started, executing the research, I started to realize that, you know, kind of broad ideas of similarity or surface level ideas, they, they really didn't necessarily mean that I'd found uniformity in the epistemologies. Um, you know, things can be really enacted differently in practice. So for example, uh, both Inuit worldviews and the critical paradigm support relationality. But relationality is much more a part of the foundation of Inuit worldviews than it is in the critical paradigm. Um, you know, so for, for an example, from my research, uh, critical scholarship often frames findings in terms of the status quo being problematic, problematic. And it, it's kind of focused on changing a negative. And then as I was considering how we would share research findings, that framing really didn't feel helpful because it might risk damaging relationships with colleagues and funders. You know, Nunavut's a small place and I was writing about work being done by colleagues who I respect and, you know, who come to my house for dinner, you know? Um, 
So with the help of the accountability framework, I could reconsider how findings could be productively framed in alignment with both Inuit and critical perspectives. Um, and so with Inuit approaches foregrounded, the result is a much more strength-oriented, solution-focused framing that speaks in terms of opportunities for building rather than tearing down, um, while at the same time not pulling any punches, you know, not, not ignoring uh, problems that exist. So I think focusing too much on how the paradigms aligned uh, risked losing loss of important nuance. And those nuances are important parts of the two epistemologies that come together. You know, it's why we need the two, because um, they have important nuance, and you want to make sure you're uh, involving them both wholly. Um, and, you know, it also, looking for sameness also risked privileging my Western training. Um, another example is, you know, when I started working in Nunavut, I remember seeing a poster of Inuit societal values on the wall, and one of those values was Tungunarnik, and you know, it's about being welcoming. And I thought, ah, I know how to be welcoming. Um, but it took me a long time to understand that I was being welcoming based on how I was taught to be welcoming in Southwest Nova Scotia, um, not what that means in Nunavut, you know? And so there is an important distinction there. Uh, now, going back to Tracy, uh, Tracy says that meaningfully coherent project does not need to follow strictly one par paradigm. Um, and so, you know, I came to understand or believe that meaningful coherence um, doesn't require that all people, decisions, and actions in a project need to follow the same understandings about the world. Um, neither Pillary Katiginik or the Kagik model advise that people working together need to think about the world in the same way. Um, and actually, through these concepts, differences in ways of thinking are welcomed. Uh, and that was really freeing, to be honest, because when I stopped trying to cram Two epistemologies into the same mold, I really had space to value and engage with Inuit ways of knowing um, as a colonial with my own ways of knowing. Uh, and so both knowledge systems could be respective, respected and be themselves and work together while each remaining distinct. And so that was just a, like a helpful reminder about how the goal was to bridge and not to blend the two knowledge systems. My second key lesson um, was that power imbalances need to be redressed with intention, and I would say ongoing focus and deliberate attention. Um, although I committed to conducting my research by centering Inuit worldviews, I acknowledge that I didn't always know exactly what it meant to do that. You know, th for example, there were times in storytelling sessions with Inuit participants, um, when I started to feel that some of my follow-up questions were kind of off base, like they were maybe framed from a more critical stand stance and they didn't really resonate or they didn't they weren't comfortable um but the accountability framework helped me to reconsider how i was using questions you know without being enoch and having embodied inuit knowledge there's no way that i was ever going to prevent all the instances when i would follow a more western approach i couldn't eliminate the power differential that would privilege Western perspectives, but by using a tool like the accountability framework, it kind of helped me to, to counteract that and I could take action to kind of resist those forces. The framework really laid bare the actions that I was going to take in the project, as well as the values and assumptions underlying those actions. So it helped with a conscious working through of tensions. Um, and so as, as was mentioned in the introduction as well, um, during storytelling sessions, people were sharing with me threads of a common story. And I started to think like, oh my gosh, this is going to make such an impactful critical analysis. People need to know about this. Um, but then when I came back in participatory analysis, people didn't agree. Um, and I was so conflicted because I felt like this information could be so impactful. Um, but, you know, going back to the accountability framework, you know, where ideas of listening, relational accountability, and Inuit governance were highlighted, reminded me of the importance of that participatory analysis process. And pushing ahead with my critical analysis, no matter how impactful I thought it might be, would be inexcusable. And in fact, a breach of both uh, Inuit worldview and critical paradigm principles, you know, where co-creation of findings and power sharing are valued. And finally, um, I had initially uh, put pressure on myself to follow Inuit worldviews perfectly, but this was not a possible or helpful expectation. Um, so 
lesson number three, reflexivity and humility are essential. It, it was clear through conducting the research that nobody expected me to fully embody Inuit ways of knowing. I mean, how could I? You know, if, if a paradigm is a set of beliefs and the Inuit worldview is grounded in beliefs that I don't hold, I, I wasn't raised with them, then I can't ever claim to entirely operate from this perspective, no matter how much I learn about it. Um, so I had to do bridging work, and that required me to engage critically, reflexively, and humbly with my own positionality and worldview as I worked to center Inuit worldviews. Um, there's a paper that I really like by Castleton Martin and colleagues who emphasize that bridging knowledge systems doesn't happen at a desk. It's a social process. It's worked out by people, and it has relevance and meaning in context. And that's why cycling through the accountability framework was essential. There's no way I could have gotten it done right at the first, you know, sitting at a desk in Toronto preparing for research. You know, it had to be worked out as I went, meaning that I needed to humbly accept that I was going to make some missteps. Um, but, you know, with our heart committed to contributing to the common good, you know, we can recognize and address missteps quickly, uh, as quickly as possible. And a final piece of this is that, you know, for Inuit rights to self-determination to be upheld through my research project, I needed to practice relational accountability and seek Inuit governance and collaboration along the way. Um, it's not for me to say how well the bridging work was ultimately done. Um, what I can do is show my heart, be transparent about intentions and approach, be reflexive and humble and responsive, and discuss my work um, with Inuit and Nunavumiut along the way. And then from those actions, uh, folks can judge whether or not or in what ways the research makes sense and will be relevant to them. So now I want to just share briefly what all that method methodological work led to. <clears throat> and I have to say that the bridging work was the most challenging part of the whole dissertation. Uh, everything seemed to flow much more easily from there. Um, but I really don't think that flow would have happened had I not spent so much time consciously thinking about paradigm bridging throughout the research trajectory. Um, so just in brief, um, I engaged participants through various means, largely snowball sampling through trusted relationships. Then I had storytelling sessions with 25 participants in two communities. Analysis involved bringing preliminary findings back to participants um, and stakeholders, which significantly shaped the overall outputs. And then um, I'm still working on knowledge mobilization. So just briefly, I want to share three knowledge products uh, that came out of the findings, uh, all of which are critical while foregrounding Inuit ways of knowing. So they each of these three outputs, they weave insights from Inuit knowledge with discussions of changes that need to happen in the status quo as informed by Inuit worldviews and critical theory. So in this way, the findings were both theoretically informed and offered direction for practical application, which is what I really wanted, you know, and, and that's a value of Inuit uh, research methods as well is, is um, action-oriented research. It doesn't mean anything if it just exists as knowledge, it needs to be applied. Uh, so this first knowledge product uh, is an image of, or it's a figure of an innervik, which is a frame on which skins are stretched to be turned into useful products. So likewise, this figure is intended to help turn Inuit knowledge into useful rehabilitation practices. So what I could do here was I had um, some key Inuit uh, knowledge values that were raised through the project, which through critical and Inuit perspectives could be translated into concrete actions that professionals could take to practice and um, be useful to Inuit clients. In the next manuscript, through comparative tables, such as the excerpt presented here, um, I considered what participants were saying in the storytelling sessions in contrast with the norms of mainstream rehabilitation services for children. So this example that I've pulled from another very long table, I have something with long tables, but anyway, <laughs> um, this example shows how I heard Inuit participants describe uh, how everyone has a valued role in their community, no matter their abilities. And when you're supporting children, um, you work with them at their own pace, focused on what they're ready to learn next. I contrasted this with what I know of many mainstream rehabilitation development assessments and how they're oriented. And it's with an underlying assumption that quote unquote normal can be objectively measured and that we need to help children catch up to the standardized timeline 
you know, that was created through Western worldviews anyway. Um, but with that said, from both perspectives, the ultimate action is to support children with skills that they have difficulty with. And so this example shows that the knowledge and actions rehab professionals use to support children are not necessarily problematic, but rather the approach and frame through which this work is done might not be helpful. And so I think it's through this kind of exercise that as therapists, we can come to understand the assumptions we're making in practice, the power they hold, um, and that it doesn't need to be that way in order for our work to be helpful. So kind of like that uh, football analogy that I had, I feel like this is an example of critical and Inuit perspectives working together to give the elbows to the status quo and make space for Inuit worldviews in practice. And finally, Sivumu um, Kateginik Saimakai Tiginikut is one of the five Inuit knowledge concepts identified two slides ago on the Intervik. Um, and it's about moving forward together in reconciliation. And how do we do how do we do that? How do we find the right path? And so this um, final manuscript for my dissertation emphasizes how bridging work can happen in practice and how it's not a singular path, but must be determined at each encounter. It's really contextually dependent. So on this image, if you imagine heading up to that fire on the hill, starting from your current vantage point, you're going to collect fuel for the fire along the way. Which way would you go? In Nunavut, Inuit have traditionally used itsutit, or Arctic heather, as fuel for fire. Someone from southern Canada might recognize the wood source, which in Nunavut is most commonly a pallet, um, as fuel for fire. But it's possible to, to imagine any number of paths to the fire, uh, some that lead you mostly to itsutit, some that lead you to mostly wood, and others where you might collect any number of combinations of both materials. And so I think providers have the opportunity to support people to reach their desired destination, regardless of the path people take to get there. Um, I think this really emphasizes how bridging work is contextually dependent, um, which is relevant talking uh, about kind of the substance of my research, the, the rehab practices, but also the methodology, right? The bridging work is contextually dependent. Um, and if I could just take two minutes, I want to share just a really quick postscript on the idea of emic and edic perspectives. Um, Gail Teachman, who many of you will know, invited me to share some of my work in one of her classes recently where they were uh, talking about emic and etic positions um, or the insider-outsider dynamic. And through this, I had a really interesting realization that I hadn't previously recognized. Um, you know, I've emphasized through this presentation how I'm not Enoch and I don't embody any ways of knowing. Uh, so I really entered the research from an etic position. However, when I was thinking about uh, what it means to be in an etic position communicating findings, I, that didn't feel like it was right anymore. You know, it didn't feel like that was accurate to what I had done. Um, so those findings I just shared with you are about things that implicate me as a therapist, things that impact me as much as they impact the people I would work with. Um, and so if I plugged this kind of issue back into the accountability framework, I would be reminded that Pillory Katiginik is about working for the common good, which includes everyone in a community. And I live here now, um, so that includes me. Um, and in the Kagik, I'm welcomed to listen for what my role is, but then I can participate in the collective work. So I commissioned this illustration from Enoch artist Aya Kamingyopik to help explain some of the research findings about how we can come from different perspectives. Um, and when there's respect and equitable power division, we can work together. Um, and so this was commissioned for application to the findings, but I think that it works equally well for illustrating how bridging Inuit and Western paradigms have potential um, to provide benefit, again, when there's respect and equitable power uh, balance. So I think the opportunity to enter research with awareness of one's ethic or outsider position and exit with that ethic position unchanged, but as part of a collective with shared findings is really special. Um, and this is something I'm hoping to kind of dig into a bit more going forward. And so in conclusion, um, I feel like the accountability tool really helped me to understand how Inuit worldviews and the critical paradigm could be in relationship um, and to help me course correct. The tensions often stumped me and still stump me, but when they were made transparent, they really could be productive learning opportunities. And so in this last slide, I want to bring us back to the idea of place. Uh, 
you know, just to emphasize what I shared with you was worked out in a very specific time and place with a very specific research project. And so I don't think that the whole thing is really transferable um, anywhere else, but I'm hopeful that the process and approach, you know, perhaps the circular figure or the table with all the content, except the headers erased, you know, might be adaptable to other contexts. Um, and I believe that, you know, an iterative, collaborative, reflexive, dynamic, you know, responsive process can help support accountability to communities and support researchers to stick to their intentions um, that can easily be led off course along the way. Uh, so I hope that it supports the production of research that is meaningful and valued to the population that it intends to serve. Um, and that's it. Koyanamik. Thank you, Jana. That was wonderful and uh, so fascinating on so many levels. And I really appreciate um, your candor in um, sharing your lived experience of this process, as well as all of the thought you you brought together to make a, make a path forward that made sense for you in the context you were in and um, and honored the values that you brought to this work. And to me, this is such a shining example of the importance of leading with values in our work, mm -hmm. as opposed to the mainstream, you know, assumption that somehow work can be value free uh, and neutral or objective. I think uh, your your work is a lovely example of the importance of doing it differently, which is also the byline of CQ. So it really just fits so well. And, it, you know, now much better appreciation of why you were such a fitting recipient of the Joan Eakin Award for Methodological Innovation in Qualitative in Critical Qualitative Health Research. So now, folks, we have um, a little bit of time for question and answer and discussion. So please um, either raise your hand using the reaction, um, raise hand thing in the reaction button, uh, that you should see on your screen or uh, put your questions in the chat. And we do have a couple in the chat now, so we can uh, alternate between live questions if you want to raise your hand and unmute your camera and, and uh, uh, raise your question directly, or we can do that through the chat and I'll accumulate what those are and we, we can alternate between them. I guess maybe while we're giving folks a moment to do that, I would love to um, hear a little bit more about what reception your work has received among INIC scholars and colleagues. Mm. Yeah, well, and, and like I say, I, I'm just uh, still working on the knowledge translation piece because I, I had a baby and uh, <laughs> it took some time off and now I've just started a full-time postdoc. But yeah, I've had a chance to share um, with the rehab, I started with the, the rehabilitation professionals working here in Nunavut. Um, and, uh, yeah, the, the meeting there was really exciting for ideas of how they could then, um, apply this knowledge concretely to what they're doing. Um, the slide with the, um, image of the landscape and the fire, um, I understand the occupational therapists here have laminated that to use as kind of a prop in their meetings with clients uh, as a way of introducing um, discussions about coming from different perspectives, but the intention to hopefully find a way of working together. So I'm really pleased um, that there's potentially um, that potentially, you know, my work is not going to just sit on a shelf, that it might have a bit of a life of its own in practice. Um, yeah, so that's that's a few initial initial things. Thank you. We've had a, a couple of questions uh, coming up in the chat, and I'll try and find where some of those started. Um, um, Mario is asking, uh, is saying, I found the presentation very interesting. I'm wondering if the purpose of bridging epistemology can be matched with the dialectical purpose of defining interpretive conflicts. I'm hoping you understand the question perhaps a little bit more than I do, or maybe if Mario's still on, we can invite some clarification from them. Yeah, that would be great yeah, if Mario could speak to that a little bit more.
sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> okay. I, I am. Hello. Could, could, hello. Could you hear me? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, the point is that uh, studying people with different cultures or different perspective, one idea is to look for a bridge, as you have done, and we can uh, communicate through this. But the other point uh, is to emphasize the conflict as a way to uh, better know. Uh, and uh, my idea is that uh, also in a single culture, we have uh, interpretive conflicts and studying mm. interpretive conflicts uh, can be uh, a strategy to better uh, it is, I'm not inviting you to do all your work in a different way, but just for the sake of the conversation, uh, reflecting on mm. the idea of uh, <clears throat> the way in which looking for deep differences uh, can be informative as uh, the way mm. that's all. Mm hmm. Yes. And yeah. You, no, that's that's a really important point. Um, yeah. And you're right. So it's interesting because I think in my methodology, I was looking for ways for things to come together. But in kind of the substantive topic of the research, I was going in expecting to look for differences between Inuit and Western ways of doing rehabilitation practice. So it's kind of interesting. I was looking for similarities in one aspect, but differences in the other. Um, and yeah, you know, it's interesting. I, I did have a lot of conversations. Um, Letia Jaynes is uh, a woman who became a collaborator in the research project as it unfolded. Um, I initially hired her as an interpreter, and then we just had in so many in-depth theoretical conversations that it became obvious that she was really a, a key part of the analysis too. And, and something that she really emphasizes is that um, the difference between us is is a space where we can talk through things and learn from each other. Um, and so I do think that, um, you know, it, it, the conflict was raised in different ways through the project. And, and um, we did use it as a tool for productive kind of learning. Um, yeah, and it may, because I was emphasizing maybe the bridging work in the methodolo methodology piece, um, maybe I didn't emphasize as much the conflicts, um, but absolutely I agree with you. Yeah, that 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 emphasizing the the difference is really productive, and that is that does speak to why I didn't want to cram both epistemologies into the same mold. You know, I I didn't want to. I wanted them to both remain distinct throughout because it felt. Um, but they they both had important contributions, and it wasn't for me to to erase any of those or to to pretend that they were perfectly aligned. Yeah, I don't know if that answers. Hopefully, that answers. Thank you. Thank you, Mario. Um, others, we have a question, Jenna. There's lots of. Uh, positive feedback in the in the chat when you have a moment to take a peek. There's also a question from Minakshi, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, who said, I found it very informative. I'm wondering if it can also be depicted through health governance approach. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I you know I'll be honest, I don't know a lot about um a health governance approach kind of as a formal um term, but uh, that sounds like it would be very productive. I know I'm curious if, if you'd like to share what your thoughts are on that. Again, no pressure to, to come online. I think they may have had to leave early. I don't see them in the participant list right now. Oh, okay. No worries. Yeah, no, I mean, that does sound, uh, it sounds promising. And I, I'm sure that there's plenty of ways to reimagine this. And, and I'd love to, to hear more about them. Yeah. Brenda has her hand up. Go ahead, Brenda. Thanks, Blake. Thanks, Jenna. That was so fantastic. And I 
I'm so appreciative of what you've been talking about because so many of my students are currently thinking about paradigms. So I think this will be really helpful to them. And I also notice in the comments, one of them mentioning that. Um, I also appreciate you talking about tensions, productive tensions. I've always felt that the qualifying it as productive tensions and the possibilities for that is really great. Although I think that there's still this issue of power and how we, our concept of power, because some tensions aren't productive, right? So I think there is that sort of tension, tension there as well. So just that's just a comment. I can't get out of my head since Naomi mentioned that in your thesis, which I haven't had the privilege of reading, that you decided to take out uh, an interpretation or some data because the story didn't sit with your participants. And I know you haven't really told us a lot about that, but in terms of thinking about analysis and, and, and this idea of participatory analysis and what do we do when people don't agree with what we put forward? I just wondered if you could talk a bit more about that because I'm unsettled by that idea. And I think it may be because I don't really know your project. Sure. So yeah, thank you. There, yeah, for sure. No, and I can say a little bit more about kind of the nature of what was shared. Um, so, it, you know, it sort of, I was noticing in, in I was, I was um, meeting with uh, people who had an interest in how children were supported. And I was meeting with a lot of parents who had children who were receiving physiotherapy services or occupational therapy services or speech language pathology services. Um, so people who were engaging with the health system um, in a, in a, on a regular basis. Um, and there was a common narrative about a specific kind of harm that was happening in that health system um, that a lot of people were experiencing. Um, and I really felt this harm needs to be said out loud um, because anybody, and then, and then, you know, I was kind of almost bringing it up to other families that I was meeting with to see if it resonated with them too. And people were going, oh yeah, oh yeah. You know, and so I was like, oh God, this is like, we're doing harm. We need to stop this particular thing, right? Um, and so I started talking about that and I brought it back in participatory analysis, but um, what I, and of course I can't speak to uh, why people didn't think it resonated, um, but I can guess that maybe uh, bringing some of this to light might risk increasing the vulnerability of some people, um, or it might shed negative light on some aspects of the community. And um, that by shedding that light, um, it might cause some people to feel harmed or vulnerable, um, and that that wouldn't be beneficial as a, as a final outcome of my project. Um, so, you know, like it is a topic that I wonder, like, could I approach it in a different way, you know, for maybe, you know, playing the long game, is this a topic that I could address in a different way through a different means with maybe that being the objective to study that particular topic, um, but addressing it through this particular research study, I, you know, I really needed to respect that it could do harm by bringing it to light. Um, and so that's, that's how I decided not to, to bring it out. Yeah. That's really, really helpful. Thank you. Cause it gives it, me a sense that it's kind of, it's an ethical decision-making process that we that's have right. to always engage in, not even just when we generate data, but when we analyze it and then share it. Right. So that's, that makes lots of sense to me. And you, you, it reminds me of Eve Tuck's work with Wang about not serving up pain narratives, you know, not, not like being yes. conscious of, of, of that idea. So, um, yeah, so that's actually a, a, something interesting to think about. I would be curious, and I'm not suggesting you say anything more right now, but I really like the idea that you're still thinking about it, right? And what other ways, perhaps within your, your bridging, your bridging idea, you could return to that. But by asking the people that you're living and working with, what do they think about that? Why that's a problematic um, direction or, or it isn't, or they have other ways forward. So yeah, that's really, really cool. Thanks. Thanks, Jenna, for that clarification. Yeah. yeah, thanks. Well, and it is really part of like, as you raise Eve Tuck's work, you know, it's a part of trying to decolonize or resist this colonial norm, you know, that the, the Inuit research strategy is saying, 
we got to stop with this of, you know, white Southerners making all the decisions about what knowledge has come to light about our people, you know? And so like that, that just was felt like important. I couldn't honor that and, and bring it out. Yeah. Thank you, Brenda. And I was wondering about, I couldn't help but think about the concept of liminal space and that notion mm. of liminal space between worlds. And I know you were making a concerted effort to privilege inuk ways of understanding, you know, the the bridging work. Um, so I, I'm not sure to what extent that concept was even useful or uh, to you in any way, but was it something that came up yeah. in you? Know, search for understanding yeah well I, and that's yeah uh not specifically but I, I that resonates when you say that now and i think about um but i think also about the the space is so context dependent too and it and the space that i occupied felt different depending on um the relationships that i had with people um you know how how well i knew people or uh, you know, I started this project with this collaborator, Litya, and only knowing her as, you know, an interpreter, um, and then got to know her very well through the process. And so I felt that maybe the space that I occupied with, you know, in relationship with her um, shifted over the course of the project. And so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, I, the, yeah, I definitely occupied a, a liminal space along the way. And I still, I, it, it's a space that I feel like I negotiate always <laughs> and, and and we'll always negotiate um where I stand um which is an interesting but also uncomfortable exercise right and that's that's kind of part of of this too was uh facing the discomfort um and and addressing it head on um in order to be able to have any chance of doing good work um to not ignore <laughs> not ignore all the tensions and and contradictions and things yeah Thank you. We might invite one last question before we close, if there is one. Naomi, go ahead. Thanks. Jenna, I'm just curious, did you have any pushback when you know when you first suggested doing this research? Was there any pushback? Um <clears throat> Uh, you know, um, maybe, but I don't remember anything significant. And, and I think actually I was a bit surprised by that because I think I really anticipated pushback. Um, and it's interesting when I started doing this research, well, sorry, I'll back up when I, when I became an occupational therapist in Nunavut, um, I realized I didn't really want to refer to myself as a therapist um, because there's some, you know, negative kind of historical connotations associated with the word therapist and people would not always understand what it actually was that I was there to do. But then when I became a researcher, I realized I didn't want to call myself a researcher. I'd rather call myself an occupational therapist um, because of all the, the negative connotations with the idea of research in Nunavut, right? Um, and so I really entered the project uh, really apprehensive um, about what I could actually do that would be appropriate for me to do from my position. Um, and so I started with this like broad, um, I guess, community consultation where I tried to meet with representatives from all the Inuit organizations, from community organiz organizations in Nunavut, from Inuit and individuals that I knew around town that, that you know, might help um, to guide me to make sure that I did this in a good way or that I addressed topics that would be relevant to the community. Um, and I think, like, I think I was actually pretty surprised by how encouraging a lot of people were, um, even some folks who didn't know me. Um, and I, but I think it was really, uh, and, and actually, um, a couple of people have said this to me that, that showing your heart, um, helps people to, uh, recognize, you know, what you're there to do, like that, you know, showing my heart, showing that, like, I was coming out and saying, I've been living here, you know, off and on for this many years. 
I feel like I've been doing a bad job. I want to do a better job and I want to center Inuit perspectives. And I really felt that um, folks were very generous and and welcoming of that, um, which I'm really grateful for. Um, so that was that was my experience. Yeah. Thanks, Jenna. Yeah, I saw that when I read parts of your dissertation too. Like you say, your heart, your authenticity really came through. And sharing the most vulnerable moments where I screwed up, <laughs> you know, like times in in uh, clinical interactions where I know I made families feel really uncomfortable, um, not on purpose, but I did. And, and so that those kinds of actions needed to be addressed. Um, yeah. So that was, yeah, yeah, that was important. Sociologist Brene Brown has a lot to say about the power of leading with vulnerability. <laughs> I have I have lots of uh, marginalia in in daring greatly, actually. <laughs> yes, <Lovely>. yes, yeah. <laughs> okay, we're we're coming into the close. Thank you so much, Jenna, for such a rich piece of work and your generosity in sharing this with us in, in this format, and uh, to Naomi also for. Uh, being here to introduce you and to all of you who joined us today. Um, we do have details queued up for the next seminar. It is with Dr. Santinel Martino, a CQ fellow at the University of Calgary. It will be on March the 1st from noon to 1230. And the topic is Crip Magic, Methodology, Mentorship and Maddening Academia. And so um, hope to see you all there. And um, Thanks again, everyone who contributed today and, and Jenna for a, a marvelous piece of work and, and uh, such a treat to, to hear you on this directly. Um, thank you all. Thank you so much.